What is up everybody, it's Animac here for Anime Uproar and today I will be breaking down the latest developments in the epic Attack on Titan story. And breaking down is definitely a good way to put it since everything is breaking down right now in the story, quite literally. We have breaking alliances, breaking walls, breaking armor and much more. Along with some classic Titan fighting action and important character development, we just witnessed a moment which we've been waiting for for seven and a half years and for over 90 chapters in the story. And I can't wait to get into all of the hype and all the excitement. If you enjoyed the Attack on Titan content on this channel and you want us to keep it going, please leave a like to let me know, it really does help. And if you're new to Anime Uproar, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to turn on all notifications. Also, a huge thank you to all of our Anime Uproar patrons who make content like this video possible with their support. Looking at how YouTube has been cheating its non-corporate creators lately, and this channel in particular, your support means more than ever, thank you so much. Finally, this video will of course contain Attack on Titan manga spoilers, we're talking about the latest reveals in the story, so please proceed with caution, you have been warned. Chapter 124 picks up where chapter 123 left off, except this time we are taken back to Liberio on the continent, where the Eldians who live there are still coming to terms with what Eren just said to them all telepathically. The fact that they also heard the message confirms that Eren's telepathic communication works long range. He can seemingly communicate with all Eldians and Ackermans, even those who are far away from the island. We actually see a glimpse of Annie's dad, Mr. Leonhardt, in Liberio. He was apparently visiting the local market and he had seemingly dropped to his knees as he heard Aaron's message. This brief appearance of Annie's dad is of course foreshadowing for what's about to happen, but more on that later. Back on Paradise Island where the Wall Titans are still stampeding, Gabby is looking for Falco. A mostly regenerated Reiner tells her that this was Falco's first time transforming into a titan, so he would not be able to remember anything that happened. Reiner thinks Falco was probably captured by Jean and Connie. Reiner is also feeling really weak and he tells Gabby that just as the walls broke apart, so did his titan armor. As a result, he was injured by the falling rubble that came off the broken wall. Gabby wants to kill Eren to protect everyone, including her family back in Liberio, but Reiner tells her that it's pointless because Eren has full control of every subject of Ymir. The sudden destruction of his armor is proof of that in Reiner's mind. Reiner is afraid that nothing will be able to stop Eren now, and he says that their only option is to run away. He then loses the remainder of his strength and he lays down and falls asleep inside a house where he and Gabby had taken shelter. Gabby then ties her hair up while looking into a mirror, very similarly to the way we saw Eren tie up his hair while looking into a mirror back in chapter 106. Gabby is also talking about not giving up as she does this, and Eren was doing the same. Gabby was talking about not giving up on Falco, and Eren was talking about how they must keep fighting because if they don't fight, they cannot win. After that scene, which establishes a clear parallel between Gabby and Eren, Gabby leaves Reiner to rest and she heads out on her own. She is determined to find all their friends, including Falco and Peek, and to get them all to safety. But before we move on, I want to talk about that brief scene where Gabby tied up her hair while looking into a mirror. I know it seems like a minor detail, but this brief scene could actually be telling us a lot more than we even realize. Now sure, there are a lot of parallels between Eren and Gabby. They both had difficult childhoods and became child soldiers. They both had an enemy that threatened their way of life, and they were both determined to destroy that enemy at all costs. After witnessing people close to them dying as a result of a titan attack, both Eren and Gabby became bent on revenge, but eventually their characters developed beyond just being angry revenge-seeking tweens. So maybe this scene is just meant to drive home the point that there are many similarities and parallels between Eren and Gabby, the only difference is that they happen to find themselves on the opposite sides of the same conflict. However, knowing Isayama, I am a bit worried that this scene could be foreshadowing something a lot more sinister. 
what if Isayama is telling us that the reason Eren tied his hair in that specific way while looking at the mirror and talking to himself about not giving up is because he is actually recreating a future memory. The future memory of the next Attack Titan user, Gabby Braun. What if Isayama is giving us a subtle clue that by the end of the story, Gabby will eat Eren and become the next attack slash founding slash Warhammer Titan? Which means that some of the future memories that Eren possesses are not his own. Some of them belong to Gabby. I'll be real with you, I think Gabby's character has developed a lot, and later on in this video, I will talk about her character development and how she earned my respect to an extent. But with that said, would I ever want to see Gabby eat Eren? No, a thousand times, no. I certainly hope that this is not how Attack on Titan will really end. But if it does, it wouldn't be all that surprising knowing how merciless Isayama's writing can be to some of our favorite characters. We'll have to wait and see, but I'm definitely hoping that I'm wrong on this one and that this scene wasn't foreshadowing that Eren will be eaten by Gabby sometime in the near future. Although the whole concept of future memories and the idea that Eren might have been recreating a future memory that belongs to Gabby because she eats him in the future is definitely concerning to me. Elsewhere on the battlefield, Armin, Mikasa, Jean and Connie regroup on one of the rooftops. It turns out that Jean did indeed capture an unconscious Falco and Falco has been tied up and gagged by the scouts. Jean points out an interesting and ironic fact. The exact thing that those people across the ocean feared the most would come to pass now thanks to what they did. Because they were afraid of the Eldians on the island and kept attacking them, they are now going to be destroyed by Eren in retaliation. If they hadn't kept attacking the islanders and forcing them into a corner, they wouldn't have brought about this catastrophe. But with their relentless hatred and repeated attacks, they turned the rumbling into a self-fulfilling prophecy. Armin still thinks that this is too extreme. Eren's apparent strategy would be an unprecedented massacre, but Eren is doing all of this in order to protect the people that he cares about the most. Knowing everything that we know about the outside world, this may be the only way to realistically protect the people that Eren loves, and that is the dilemma. No matter how hard the islanders tried to find a peaceful solution, the outside world, including Eldians on the continent and the people who advocate for the rights of Eldians, keep using the islanders as scapegoats for all of their problems and they all seem to support attacking Paradis and destroying all the Eldians on the island. They all continue to demonize the islanders as devils and advocate for their annihilation. I mean, what would you do in that situation? What would any of us do? First you try to stay out of everyone else's business by hiding away on an island, then you try to use the rumbling as a deterrent, then you try to find a peaceful solution with the other nations, but none of this works. They still keep hating you and keep attacking you and they won't stop until you and everyone you care about is dead. Would you just stand by and do nothing because you want to keep your hands clean? Or would you say screw it and do exactly what Eren is doing? It's not an easy choice by any means. Now this part is very important. For some reason the pure titans that Zeke created are still attacking the humans and not just the invading Marleans but also the domestic soldiers and Eren's own comrades. And this is happening even though Eren supposedly has control over all of the titans. This turn of events seems to indicate that Eren might not have full control over the subjects of Ymir since he obviously wouldn't have sent titans to attack Armin, Mikasa and his other comrades. So, are Eren's powers actually more limited than we thought? If they are, then maybe there is a way to defeat Eren after all, even in this new Titan form. Although we will need more information before I make any such speculations. A new dilemma now emerges for the scouts. What do they do with the captured Falco? Kony wants to feed Falco to his mom's pure Titan form in order to revive his mother. But Armin warns that this would cause additional conflict with Reiner and Peek because they are all very close to Falco. Kony is still clearly traumatized by what happened to his mother and he still goes to visit her at his village whenever he can. You will recall that she was turned into an abnormal titan who cannot move on her own, so for that reason she was not killed but rather left inside the village in her titan state. 
We really can't blame Kony for wanting to bring back his mother after all these years of being forced to look at her in that condition and yet being helpless to help her. Sadly for Kony, I sincerely doubt that he will succeed in reviving his mother. From a narrative perspective, she is such a minor character and Falco is far more important for the story. Armin, Kony, Mikasa, Jean and the other scouts jump into action in order to take down the rampaging titans. At the same time, Yelena, Oyan Konpon and a bunch of other soldiers are surrounded by titans inside a fort and they are basically trapped with nowhere to go. Elsewhere, Kaya is attacked by a titan. She is the little girl who saved Gabby and Falco earlier and the same girl who was saved from a titan by Sasha much earlier in the story. Kaya thinks back to the time when her mother was eaten by a titan and she was almost killed herself before Sasha managed to save her. Kaya calls out for Sasha to save her once again, but instead of Sasha, who we all know sadly is dead, Kaya is saved by none other than Gabby. Yes, Gabby, who manages to shoot the titan through the mouth and then again through the neck, killing it. Ironically, as she is saved by Gabby, Kaya sees the image of Sasha reflected in Gabby. For a brief moment, Kaya thinks that Gabby must be her sister, Sasha. This is of course ironic because Gabby was the one who killed Sasha and everyone hates her for it, but with that said, this moment is important. Gabby's resemblance to Sasha here is more than just a passing detail. This moment emphasizes the idea that despite all the things that she has done, Gabby is not necessarily a bad person. She was just doing what she thought was right based on her specific life experiences and her specific socio-cultural context. I know this is going to be controversial because we all hate what she's done and how brainwashed she was at the beginning, but as hard as it may be, we have to try to put ourselves in Gabby's shoes. We know that she grew up with Marlene propaganda being hammered into her every day from a very young age, Propaganda which taught her that the islanders were pure evil and that it was her duty to kill them for the good of mankind. She then also witnessed the destruction of Liberio and the deaths of many innocent people, including her friends Zofia and Udo, at the hands of these same islanders. Gabby did not get to see what we saw. Gabby did not see the suffering that the islanders themselves went through as a result of Marley's attacks on them. She did not see the destruction of Shiganshina district and the deaths of all those innocent people, including Eren's mom. All Gabby could see was the propaganda that was telling her that the islanders were evil. When she then sees the islanders attacking Liberio without having the proper context for why they had to do it, her belief that the islanders are evil devils is confirmed in her mind. She then goes on to fight the islanders and she ultimately kills Sasha, but we can't ignore the context within which Gabby is operating. Gabby's life story represents a critical lesson about human nature and human history. If you form an opinion based solely on one side of the story, if you take everything you hear at face value without questioning it, and if you don't have the full info about the history and the context of the situation, it will be very easy for someone to manipulate you and get you to do horrible things without even realizing it. It's always important to be skeptical, to question, and to do your own research before forming an opinion. When the soldiers discover Gabby and attempt to arrest her for being a Marlan infiltrator, Kaya, Nicolo, and the other members of Sasha's family cover for Gabby. They say that she isn't a Marlan, but rather one of them, a member of their family. This saves Gabby from being imprisoned or possibly even executed by the soldiers. As they evacuate the area, Kaya and Gabby discuss why Gabby decided to risk her life to save Kaya, and they talk about which one of them is a devil. Kaya says that she is a devil for trying to kill Gabby earlier, but Gabby says that no, she is the real devil because she killed so many people just to make others happy, just to please the Marleyan military and be praised by them. Ding ding ding, ladies and gentlemen, we finally have a major character development alert for Gabby. We can still hate what she's done, but clearly her character is finally developing and evolving, clearly she is learning, and we have to respect that. Interestingly enough, Nicolo says that there is a devil inside all of us, and that is why the world turned out the way that it did in the first place. This is another crucial lesson about human nature, and it applies to our own non-fictional world as well. We all have destructive, selfish, and aggressive tendencies within us, at least once in a while, and this leads to all the wars, suffering, and destruction in the world. The world of Attack on Titan always was just a slightly more fantastical mirror for our own world, 
And I am fascinated by how much reading the Attack on Titan story makes me think about our own world and the issues that our own world is facing. Meanwhile, back at the fort, our boy Shaddis swoops in and kills a Titan and he saves a bunch of soldiers in the process. I am guessing that these soldiers are new recruits since they all look pretty young and pretty shook up. Mikasa, Jean, Armin and everyone else join the fight in order to kill the Titans before the Titans can consume every human in sight. All the Titans are lured to the fortress where they are killed with the help of vertical maneuvering gear, sharp blades and thunder spears. Armin takes it upon himself to personally put the Titan of Commander Pixis out of its misery by taking him out with a Thunder Spear. He thanks Pixis for taking them all as far as he did in his capacity as Commander, and then Armin goes on to end the life of the Titan Pixis with a precise shot from the Thunder Spear. It is a tragic death for such a memorable character, but a fitting one as well. He was given a quick and efficient death by Armin before he could go on to consume his own soldiers and subordinates, and that is definitely an end that Pixis himself would have preferred over the alternative. After the Titans are dealt with, Yelena and some of the volunteers are placed under arrest. The other soldiers on the island aren't too pleased when they realize that Zeke's real goal wasn't the restoration of Eldia, but the sterilization of all Eldians. Later, Sasha's father leads Mikasa and Armin to where his family is hiding, along with Gabby. Gabby asks where Falco is, and she says that she doesn't want to fight anymore. If they just let her and Falco leave, they will go away and they won't bother anyone again. However, Armin explains that Kony plans to use Falco to revive his mother. Gabby loses it, she drops to her knees and begs for Falco's life. She says that Eren should be able to just turn everyone including Kony's mother back into a human since he now has the founding titan power, but Armin is skeptical because if Eren really possessed that kind of power, then why wouldn't he just turn all the soldiers that were turned into titans by Zeke back into normal humans again? This, as I mentioned earlier, is a very interesting point, and it suggests that Eren's founding titan power may be limited. Was Eren unable to turn these particular titans back into humans because they were turned into titans by Zeke? Or is there some other limitation that Eren has? A limitation that we are not aware of. Gabby points out that Reiner's armor crumbled at the same time as the walls crumbled, so presumably this means that Eren has power over all titans and that he deliberately caused the armored titan's armor to fall apart. But Armin isn't so sure, and he thinks back to Eren saying that all hardening would come undone, and he suddenly realizes that as the wall crumbled and the armored titan's armor crumbled, Annie's crystal must have also crumbled. The final page of the chapter shows Annie lying on the ground, her crystal broken, Annie is finally awake, her eyes wide open. After 90 chapters and seven and a half years of real world time, as well as like five years of in story time, Annie is freaking back. Fun fact, she was initially encased in the crystal way back in chapter 33, which came out in May of 2012. She would remain in the crystal until December of 2019. That's pretty crazy when you think about it, a massive amount of time. Clearly this is extremely hype, something that we've been waiting for for so long, and this makes chapter 124 another incredibly memorable chapter, although they've pretty much all been unforgettable in the past few months. So here are the big questions that this chapter has raised. First, it raised the question of whether Eren's newfound power is actually limited. When he first began transforming and initiated the rumbling, we were assuming that he had unlocked the full potential of Ymir's power and that he would be unstoppable. However, this chapter has cast some doubt on that due to the fact that Eren allowed the titans created by Zeke's spinal fluid to keep rampaging and attacking his comrades. Since we know that Eren is doing everything that he is doing in order to protect his friends, it wouldn't make much sense for Eren to stand by and watch his friends get attacked if he could easily just turn those titans back into humans. So is it possible that Eren cannot turn them back because Zeke was the one who turned them into titans in the first place and Zeke's royal blood is some kind of buffer to Eren's power? Or is it just the case that Eren cannot turn any pure titans back into humans on his own? We assume that the founding titans power once fully unleashed would be practically unlimited but maybe there are limitations that we still don't know about, or maybe the fact that Eren doesn't have royal blood still limits his ability to tap into certain aspects of the Founding Titan's power. I'm sure that we will find out more about this in the next chapter, and I am definitely looking forward to that. 
The second question is about Gabby and what is going to be her role in the rest of the story. And was Isayama foreshadowing that Gabby is going to end up eating Eren? Obviously, Gabby's character has undergone a massive development, and this chapter certainly cemented that fact. Her decision to risk her life to save Kaya and their interaction after that has proven that Gabby is finally accepting the truth about Marley and about the Islanders. And she is finally rejecting the propaganda that was hammered into her since she was a small child. We also know that Gabby's character has many parallels to Eren's character, but is that all? Or is Gabby going to eat Eren and become the next Attack Titan? I love Eren as a character, as you guys know, so I definitely hope that doesn't happen. And although I respect Gabby more after this chapter, I'm in no way a fan of Gabby. But you just never know with Isayama, he loves to defy our expectations and break our hearts. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. Did this chapter change your mind about Gabby? And do you think that she may end up eating Eren before the end of the story? Was that scene where she is tying up her hair while looking at the mirror and talking about not giving up just a shout out to the Eren scene from chapter 106? Or was it something more? Was it a clue about Eren's ultimate fate in the story? Finally, now that Annie is out, what is she going to do? In my video on chapter 1, 2, 3, I said that I believe Annie will return in the next chapter because her whole motivation was to save her father back on the continent. And now that Eren announced to all Eldians that he will destroy everyone outside of the island of Paradise, Annie would have no reason to stay inside the crystal. On the contrary, she has every reason to emerge and try to stop Eren and save her father. I was right about Annie returning, but what is she going to do? Is she going to just be super sad and depressed like Reiner about everything that happened? Is she going to try to actually fight Eren? Is she going to try to reason with Armin? I'm extremely curious to see what Annie is going to do now after all of this time and after so much has happened while she was stuck inside that crystal. And I look forward to seeing what you guys think about Annie's big return, so do hit me up down in the comments. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more Attack on Titan content on this channel, please leave a like to let me know. And if you happen to be new to Anime Uproar, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to turn on all notifications. You can also hit me up on Twitter and Instagram at Anime Uproar for all the latest Attack on Titan news and updates. I want to give a big thank you to all of our Anime Uproar patrons who support our work and make videos like this one possible. With all the problems facing YouTube right now, patrons are more important than ever and we really appreciate it. Special thank you to our pro hero tier patrons including the one and only Gilgamesh, nothing but a fan, Jason Wilson, King Zeldris, Fididala Beat, Anatoly Kazatsky, Alpha Dio, Angel Cruz, and Team Sparky65. And I can't forget the ones who rise above all other clans, a massive thank you to our The One tier patrons. Including Ingrata, Alolan Adam, Matty Mac, Mako Takun, The World, Steelers, and The School Bus. If you enjoy our videos and you feel they provide value for you, please consider becoming a patron. Even a single dollar will give you access to our patron exclusive discord and your name will appear in our videos along with these legendary people. As always, thank you guys so much for watching and until next time, see ya space cowboys.